shutting off my cell phone, not that I want to influence you. <laughs> my name's Ed Mutum, and I'm an alcoholic. Amen. By the grace of God, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink or a mood-altering chemical since January 5th of 1971. And I'm extremely grateful for that. My home group is the Big Book Study Group in Davenport, Iowa. And if you're ever in Davenport, don't stay too long. It's a small group, and we like it that way. <laughs> But I'm delighted to be here. Now, I'm going to do uh, – workshops were usually not this formal with reading and that, so I'm going to be coming down there, and I'm going to talk to you. Now, why would, why would somebody want a workshop on forgiveness? Well, for me, it's, it's the number one reason I see people go out and drink. It says in our book that resentment is the number one offender, and that if we don't get rid of resentment – in fact, in the big book, it says if we don't get rid of anger, we aren't going to stay here. Well, yeah, but how do you do that, right? How in the world do you do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And not that I'm an expert on forgiveness or that I know something more than anybody else. It's just I've had some experience in my life, and i found that sharing it with other people indeed benefits them. So I'm not coming off as the expert in, uh, or, or spiritual guru. Some of you may know I'm a pastor. Please don't hold that against me. <laughs> you never hear any good jokes once they find out you're a pastor, you know? So, I'll be sitting at a conference, and we'll be talking, and somebody will walk by and say, Ed, how's your ministry? And all of a sudden, the guy that was after every other word goes, Oh, gee, pastor's so nice to see you. How have you been? <laughs> you know, pastors are people, too. It's just a job I chose to take, and it's a job I love. And if you love your job as much as I love my job, then we're both going to be happy. So uh, it's not that I think I have some magical answers. What I think I have is some answers to some questions that plagued me for a number of years sober. I don't know about you, but when I got sober, I really didn't get well real soon, you know. There was a lot of work to do, and I found that there's a lot of other people like that, too. You were handed pieces of paper and a pencil when you come in. If you weren't handed one, a George would be happy to give you one, wherever George is at. There's George. He'll be happy to give you a piece of paper. What I'd like you to do, if you'd like is if there's something in your life you just find it impossible to forgive, write it down and pass it up and we'll talk about it. Again, not that I'm an expert by any sense, but maybe, maybe just sometimes when somebody else looks at it, there's answers to be had. Here's one here. Hold your hands up just till George gets there. And George, if about 15 minutes, if you'd just pass those baskets around. Uh, that's the ask it basket. After about 15 minutes, we'll just pass them around. And I'll stop during the, the time we're talking today and I'll answer those from time to time. I, uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love being sober, and I love God. And I don't apologize for any of those three anymore, you know. But it took me a long time because when we talk about forgiveness, I hated God. I absolutely hated the idea of God. I mean, offense to no one by this, but I used to think if, that's, if that God's a God, bring him down here and I'll beat the sheet off of him. That's what I thought about God. And I am, please understand, I'm not trying to offend anybody. That's just where I was. Because I started doing something when I was a child and did it a number of years sober. I call it my 299 to 1. I could walk into a room with 300 people. 299 could turn around to me and say, Ed, you're the best. We love you. And one could go, jerk. Guess who I remembered? For days. I remembered their face. I remembered the way they looked at me. I remembered the way they were wearing their hair. You know what I forgot? The 299. Now, whose problem is that? So if I have that kind of problem going in, it's going to be next to impossible for me to forgive. Because, you see, the more fault I find with you, the anger I can be. And you know what I like? Being angry. Why? Because it's familiar. It's familiar territory. I was mad in my earliest memories, and I was annoyed. Well, first, my feelings were hurt. Isn't that wimpy? I'm 6'10", 360 pounds, and I've got to stand up here and tell you the most dominant reason that I got in most of the trouble in my life is somebody hurt my feelings. I mean, come on, that's not very macho. But it is. That's the exact reason. And I never forgot them, ever. Ever. Now, God, I used to go to church. My mother used to drag us seven little brat, uh, children to church. And that was always, you know, she deserved sainthood just for that. 
And I remember there was a guy that would always sit up front and he had thin blue lips, talk like this, all those church people do, you know. And he was sitting up there and I thought, you know, he seemed a lot happier in the bar last night, if you ask me personally. And I don't know who that grump is he's sitting with, but the gal last night was a lot more fun too. And I would look at him and I would say, what a hypocrite. What a hypocrite. Now, I know you wouldn't go this far, but here's how far I went. I didn't only judge that entire pew or that entire church. I eventually judged all organized religion by my little narrow point of view. Because, you see, I had my one. And that's all I needed. Once I got my one, you're dismissed. No more investigations required. And so I hated the church. I hated the church because I collected a lot of God. I hated God because I collected a lot of ones. When I was 10 years old, I had a cousin. And if there was anybody ever close to God, it was Linda. She was amazing. She was beautiful. She was straight A. She was talented. I hated her. You know, she put that bar so high I couldn't even leap to get it, you know. But I loved her too. I admired her. And I thought, you know, if there's anybody God loves, it's got to be Linda. Because Linda does everything right. Everything. And Linda was walking across the street one day, and a truck hit her and knocked her about 100 feet and killed her. I remember going to the funeral, and I heard people say, God must have wanted an angel. And I thought, so he hit you with a truck. <laughs> I'll pass. Still do. And I started hating God for ripping people out of my life. Nice people. And it helped me do something that I became an expert at, being a victim. Oh, God, was I good. I always get tickled when somebody comes up to me and I say, How you been? <laughs> haven't seen them in a while. And they'll say something to the effect of, Well, you know, three years ago my mother died. Yeah. And then the next year I lost my job. And lost, yeah. And, then, and, then, uh, then, and then now I'm just feeling terrible. Oh. They've summed up three years by the worst things that happened in their life. You cannot convince me that good things didn't happen in there, but guess what? They didn't register. Why? Because it would defeat our purpose. What is our purpose? To be self-involved and self-pitying, is my opinion. We don't do it. I never did it intentionally, but I became an expert at it. Grieving. There's one. Now, I have lost a lot of people in my life, a lot of people in my life through tragedy. My mother used to call me up and say, Ed, do you know what day today is? And I said, no, Mom, what is it? She said, it's the day Aunt Gladys died. I said, Mom, Aunt Gladys died ten years before I was done. She said, yeah, I just thought you should know. <laughs> and every year on that anniversary, Mom had a guaranteed depression. Guaranteed. And she insisted on having it. Now, guess what? If I'm around that type of environment, what I'm going to do automatically. I had a guy walk into my office about a year, and, year ago now, and he was nice. Don't worry about me sweat, by the way. I love humidity. It just makes me and turns me into a fire hydrant. And uh, he walked into my office, and he, it was on a Monday, and he said, You know, Ed, I'm going to really be depressed this weekend. I thought, Well, you know, at least he's planning them. You know, that's better. <laughs> Got a little idea what's going on. And I said, said, why, why, uh, why are you going to be depressed? And he said, and he got very sad, and he said, it's the anniversary of my daughter's death. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, how long ago has she died? And it had been a few years. And I said, okay. And I was prayerful for a minute. I said, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you, when you get up, when you go to bed Thursday night, put your favorite picture of her right next to your bed? Friday morning when you wake up, you turn over and you look at her, and from the moment you open your eyes, you celebrate every good thing about her. Every curl on her head, every giggle she ever had, every hug she ever gave, and all day long lift her memory and celebrate her life. Or you can make it all about you. He got mad and stormed up. I understand that. He had two good weeks of going to meetings, and people say, what's wrong? Oh, it's the anniversary of my daughter's death. It's just hard for me this time of year. And he will do it forever. Now, what does that have to do with forgiveness? Everything. you got to forgive the incident. we got to learn to forgive ourselves. You know, I liked being angry. Angry gave me ammunition for life. The way I was raised, angry is the only reason I'm still alive today. 
Because there was a number of years in my first years of drinking and using that if it wasn't for my anger, I would have been dead. But after I get sober, the same anger and the same rage around my loved ones isn't such a good idea. And I realized that the base of it is all about forgiveness. My father, my father was one of the... Now, if you had asked me when I first got sober about my father, I said, he's a drunken old fool that didn't ever do much for me. After I got sober, my father became, and it's true, one of the hardest working men I've ever known in my life. Mom always used to tell the story about Dad uh, shoveling coal during the Depression. You got 25 cents a ton for coal, and he made $18 in one day. That's my old man. Hard-working man. And he had seven of the most ungrateful, rotten kids I've ever seen in my life, and he stayed. Wouldn't hurt that. Why? Because I had to understand that anything that's causing me disease, discomfort, ruins my sobriety. Anybody you hate, anything you're not willing to forgive, everybody you love is paying for it, whether you know it or not. How? By lack of intimacy? By issues? I love that term now. Oh, God. Yeah. Issues. I have so many issues. Oh, do you have any old Playboy? <laughs> anyway, that terminal uniqueness. You know, the steps are designed, the 12 steps are designed, in my understanding, to eliminate all that. To relieve the self-obsession and constant self-evaluation to a degree. So when I am constantly self-involved, the disease remains until I make a conscious effort to stop. My dad used to call me the dumb little SOB. That was his favorite little term for me. That's all I remembered. And you know what I thought for years? I was a dumb little SOB. Oh, I'd say I am not, but deep inside I thought, yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. I'm trash. I'm worthless. And I would collect all the ones around me. All the ones around me that said that and would convince me that I was worthless, and then I'd be mad at them. Who's the collector here? It's like school. I hated school my first day. I went to school my first day, and Miss Kesey slapped me right across the face. First day in kindergarten, slapped me right across the face. I hated school from that time to this. Well, not this anymore, because I don't hate it anymore. But here's the difference. You know what I realized? I could tell you every teacher that was rotten to me, but I had a real hard time sharing with you the vast majority of teachers that were kind and supportive of me. Oh, I could tell you about Miss Kesick. I could tell you about Miss Burns in fourth grade. But what about Miss Vanderslice in second grade that was just wonderful to me and always complimented me on how I drew? What about them? It doesn't register. Why? Because I need to stay angry. Because it gives me a sense of power. Because it gets, gives me a sense of being. What about uh, brothers and sisters? I had a guy, honest to God, this is, this is a true story. He came in, like I was going to tell you a lie, but this is, this is true. But uh, he came in to me and he said, uh, Pastor Ed, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, well, what's going on? He said, man, I've hated my father for years and I need to talk to you. I said, come on in. Nice guy, very successful guy. And this guy came in and sat in my office, and he was livid. He said, I've never talked to anybody about this, but I need to talk to you. And I said, talk to me. He said, when I was 14 years old, my dad bought me a baseball glove for my birthday. And on the same day, he brought my, bought my brother, my older brother, a nicer one. And I said, yeah. And this guy had a Harvard education. Daddy paid for. I said, was your father ever abusive? He said, oh, no, no, my father. said, did he spend a lot? No, he always made time for us kids. Everything about his father, but he had his one. He had his one and had hated his father for 40-plus years. 
He didn't after he left that day. But he had hated him for 40 plus years. Why? Because I guess he felt he needed to. Anybody you hate owns you. You know what they do. Two o'clock in the morning when they come to mind. You should be sleeping. Who owns you? They do. Lock, stock, and barrel. Lock, stock, and barrel. You really want to get it some, uh, even with somebody who, who you hate? Love them. Love them, love them to death or to life, if you will. But this constant hating and returning and re-going over problems and going over problems. And today, people love to talk about their childhood. People just love to talk about their childhood. And I understand difficulties in childhood. I was molested when I was a child. Yes, I admit it. And I also got to admit I loved every minute of it. Can't say that. Yeah, you can. Because I'm not hip to doing what everybody else is doing, and it happens to be the truth. Now, was it right? Well, no. But that doesn't change what I've experienced. You know? And I'll be doggone if somebody else's idea is going to make me feel guilty. It's called freedom. One of the things the 12 Steps has allowed me to do is feel who I am and be who I am. Not feel, but experience. Because one of the things I often say is feelings are not facts. That confused me for a long time. I always thought feelings were fat. By God, if you felt that way, that's the way it was. And my sponsor told me one time, he said, You know, Ed, you don't get locked up for how you think. You get locked up for how you act. I don't care what you think. Watch how you act. And I'll give you a little example of that. I was about two and a half years sober, and he got me a job as a, at a hotel. I was a bellhop from 11 to 7. Had a little blue hat, a little blue coat that came right up to here on me. And I'd sit there from 11 to 7. And little old ladies would come in and drop their bag on my foot. Pick, pick up that bag, boy. And I'd think, which one? You were it. <laughs> I'm allowed to think that. What I did is go, yes, ma'am. And I'd go upstairs and I'd take the bag and I'd go into their room and I'd, I'd put it in their room and I'd go to the door and wait for my tip and they'd shut the door and like to break my fingers. And I'm thinking, I'm going to kick in the door, grab this old broad and throw out the window, watch her splatter. <laughs> but what I did is I said, thank you. And I went downstairs. Doesn't sound like much, does it? It's called freedom from the bondage of self. I learned that my feelings were not facts. I learned that I could act differently than I feel. Now, you may have all known that all your life. I somehow missed that information. Because if I was sad, I'd get sadder because I'm sad. You know? I remember one time a gal was working for me. She said, came in, she happened to be an AA, and I said, uh, how you doing? She said, I'm having a bad day. I said, well, enjoy it. <laughs> she said, what are you talking about? I said, don't think about it. You make it a horrible day. She said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know about you, but if I get up and I think I have a bad day, as soon as I get thinking about a bad day, I could make it a worse day. Because I hate bad days, and this is a bad day, and this is going to be a worse day. And I've had a lot of them, you know, and when I review my sobriety, it's been over and over and over. And by the time I get to work, I'm terribly depressed. So I said, just have a bad day and enjoy it. You know what she said? Feel better already. <laughs> Attitude. Attitude. Teachability. Why would I want to give up? Uh, if, I don't, if I'm not angry at them anymore, does that mean what they did is okay then? No. What it means is you're tired of paying the tab for it. I had a gal, I was down in Longview, Texas, and she came up to me and she said, I'm going to talk to you. And I thought, okay, here we go. And she said, uh, I said, how can I help you? She said, uh, my dad's been dead for, I'm 56 years old. I've hated my dad for 56 years, and he's been dead for 20. And I said to her, well, okay, uh, how's that working for you? And I said, uh, why, why are you mad? And I knew why she was mad, because you see it over and over. He molested me. And I said, so you've kept the molestation alive for the last 20 years because he's been dead. She said, I never thought about that. I said, you might consider that. He's gone. And you're still making it happen over and over again. You might, and she said, I, I, I just never thought of that. And then she said a question that was just great. I just love this question. She said it like this, and the answer came like that. And I got it from God as I understand him, believe me. She said, okay, well, what if I die and go to heaven and he's there? Isn't that a great line? And like that, I thought, I said to her, what a perfect place to meet him, because if he's in the heaven, I understand. He understood all the harm he's ever done to you. 
And he's asked for forgiveness. So what better place to meet him? And she walked away from me and she said, for the first time in 56 years, I'm a free woman. It isn't that we like to stay sick and angry, I don't believe. It's because we don't know any other way. At least I didn't. At least I didn't. What about people at work? Ooh, you know? What about people at work? They're out to get your job. You know it. I know it. Uh, they're in the corner talking about me again. I know it. They're just jealous. They're just not thinking about me as much as I'm thinking about me. You know? What would happen... If you took the principles of this program and took them to work. Oh, I know, new idea. Instead of just in meetings. You know, I hear all the time people say, you know, it's tough to work this program at home. That's a load of crap. The truth is, it's the last place we ever apply it. That's the truth. We're busy impressing the guys and gals at meetings. How you doing? Oh, living one day at a time. Living, let live. live, live. <laughs> and then being the same jerk to everybody who waits on you. Uh, being the same jerk to your family. Having the same resentment. Same... And then come in a meeting and go, yeah, live and let live, day to time. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But bring this into work. How about if you treated everybody at work as if they were a newcomer? How would that change your life? <laughs> How would it change theirs? Because we have a unique gift of making people very uncomfortable. So how would it change theirs too? What would happen if all of a sudden we started looking at life as to what we could add to it instead of what we could take from it. What we could give to it instead of what it owes us. One of the reasons that I stayed mad for a long time, and I need to tell you, I don't know where I got this, but I had a sense of entitlement that I don't know where I got it. I certainly didn't get it from my mom and dad. Man, they worked for every rotten dime they ever had. All of a sudden, I come along and you owe me something. One of the greatest freedoms I've ever experienced is to understand you don't owe me a thing. In fact, I've been overpaid. I'll share with you what I got. Now, where did I learn that? In seminary? No, I learned that in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You taught me that if I want to actually get better in every area of my life, if I really want to take this program to what it means, it's not just about your alcoholism or your addiction. It's about your life. You ever taken a good look at step three? Turned my will and my life. What more is there? Yet how many of us do it? I don't know about you, but for a long time I turned my alcoholism over. Yeah, I turned my alcoholism over. That's what I'll turn over. But everything else I'm going to hang on to. And one of the things I love about the steps is it tells us in the big book that we're reborn. Reborn is the, a, a sentence right out of there. What does that mean? Starting a whole new life. How can you have a whole new life if you're still resenting your old one? Of what happened to you when I was a kid? I was always called white trash. And we kept the image up pretty good, I must say. We did a good job of it. You know, when you got a position in the community, you're expected to uphold it. We did well. And I laugh and joke about that, but i got to tell you, that was the toughest thing for me to ever shake. Especially when I'm meeting the President of the United States, no matter what party you're in. Yeah. I don't have that problem anymore. Because I'm not that person anymore. And I'm not that image anymore. Why? Because I've forgiven them for programming me that way. And I've forgiven me for listening. When I was a year sober, a little over a year sober, I, uh, the old man told me to come over to the house. said, boy, why don't you come on over for dinner? And I don't know about you, but when my old man asked me over for dinner, there was big trouble. But I'd hung around you guys for a while, and you told me uh, that if uh, something was going to change in my family, it had to begin with me. Couldn't wait for them to shape up. It had to start right here. So I went to dinner. I suited up, and I showed up, and I went to dinner. And uh, we had a nice dinner, and about halfway through, Dad said, Boy, and I thought, Oh, here it comes. I said, Yeah, Pop. He said, Just want to tell you I'm proud of you. 
uh, stop my world. You know, they say when you get sober, and by the way, I co-sign this all the way, that miracles will happen in your life. If miracles aren't, it's because you haven't done what's asked. It's just because you haven't done what's asked. You do what's asked, miracles happen. And I believe that. I co-sign it. I lived it. I experience it to this day. But you want to know what? My old man telling me he was proud of me wouldn't even made the list of miracles. That was just so far beyond my concept of reality. Thank God. I just wouldn't have. If, when I walked into the house that night, had you hooked a lie detector up to me and said, do you care what your old man thinks about you? I would have said no and it would have said true. I am so grateful I was so horribly wrong about so many things. And I got to find it out sober. You know what? I celebrate when I'm wrong because then I can start new. Then I can start new. And that night he told me he was proud of me. And I've realized a lot of things since that day. I, one, it was the first time I ever gave him anything to be proud of me about. You know, you're not so proud when you come coming down to bail your son out of jail and you're so drunk they throw you in and let him go home. That's not a, that's not a good deal, you know. I remember mom come home and said, where's dad? said, in jail. <laughs> How'd he get there? Have no idea, mom. <laughs> but also it, it, it threw a kink and I hated him, you see. I hated him. And when you start taking that away, you're taking away my identity. You're taking away the familiar. If I give this up, then what am I going to have? What am I going to be? If I give this up, if I give up all this stuff I've lived all these years and all this anger... What am I going to be? It's called it peace. God, I missed that one. It's like my sponsor one time. You know, you got, I hope you got a sponsor. If you don't, get one. Trust me, it works better. I went up to my sponsor one time, and, and when you got a sponsor after a while, you can ask them the tricky questions, you know, the ones you just wouldn't ask everybody. And I said, uh, how do you be a gentleman? And he said, you act like one, Ed. Man, I would have never thought of that. You mean you just act like it? Yeah. That's how you become a gentleman. You want to be a better father? Act like it. You want to be a better partner? Act like it. There's no big mystery. You see, I liked working through the process. I liked working through it, looking at it, and deciding what's good for me today. I stayed crazy all that time, but I was interested. I liked my insanity, you know. I ran into a guy in Bowling Green, Kentucky, about two years ago. He was a nice guy. He used to go to meetings with us. Up in, uh, uh, by the way, be here tonight for Karen's talk. Karen and I go way back. We're secretly married, but I can't reveal that. Um, <laughs> I lost where I was being so cute, though. No. I really did. Thank you, Bowling Green. Uh, and I, I, there's a guy there, and he said, Ed, how are you? And I said, good. And he said, do you remember me? And I really didn't remember him. But I've learned to be honest about that. I just said, no, I don't. He said, oh, I remember you. And I said, really? I said, why is that? And he said, Thursday night meeting. You knocked the guy out with one punch. And I said, ooh, jeez. And I thought, shh, don't tell anybody. Shh. I'm a spiritual guru now. Shh. And I'm so grateful he told me that, because that's when I was processing my anger. I was working through it. I was doing pretty good, too. And we had this meeting, and it was a participation meeting. And this guy was chattering at the first part of the participation. I tapped him on his back, and I said, excuse me, uh, can't hear the speaker, you know, the participants. And, oh, okay, okay. And at the coffee break, uh, he got up and said, don't, don't tell me to shut up. And I, I said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. See, in the first part of the meeting, we don't talk during participation. And little Alice come over. Little Alice come over and put her hands on my chest said, Big Ed, sit down, Big Ed. Oh, I said, oh, honey, don't worry about me. I'm just having a conversation with this guy. It's just... And Alice went and sat down. And a few minutes back, she was saying, Big Ed, sit down. And I said, you don't... Honey, well, I'm just talking with this guy. And I turned around and he said, don't you ever... And the next thing I know, he's flying over four rows of chairs. My first thought, honestly, was, how am I going to tell my sponsor about this one? <laughs> and my program kicked in immediately. I went around the chairs, and I woke him up. And I made direct amends to him right there. And I sponsored him for the next five years. 
Barry O. Yeah, Barry said nobody had ever gotten his attention before. He'd been around, but... Now, I say that, and it's cute and it's funny, but it's also very disgusting because one of the things I've always loved about AA is the sense of safety that I have here. I do not condone putting your hands on anybody in a meeting unless there's some dangerous things happening, which I've been in meetings where that happened too. But I don't condone that. I share that story with you because at that time I was working on my anger. <laughs> now, I was processing it. And I was expressing how I felt. Shortly after that, I'm going out to Thousand Oaks to speak at a meeting. And I'm on the freeway there north of uh, uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I loved L.A. I lived there for 17 years. And car rage was just wonderful. When you don't have much of a program and you're working on your anger, it's a great place to live. And I really liked it. Because you could get out and beat each other up all day long. Nobody called the cops. I was just getting home. And uh, I'm going out to speak. And I'll give this spiritual talk, and this guy cuts me off, says I'm number one, and locks up his brakes. And I slow down the car, and uh, then he did my favorite movie, went, pull over. I thought, excellent, okay, let's pull over. Let's do that, let's pull over. And he pulled over, and he got out of his car, and as soon as he opened the door, that was my green light. He's coming at me. He opened the door. I got out and I grabbed him by the crotch in his collar and I threw him over his car. And I thought, oops, I'm probably not supposed to be doing this, you know. Good member of the program. I went over and I picked him up, put him back in his car, dusted him off and said, you know, I'm a member of a 12-step program. And when we do something wrong, we make him. His eyes got this big. You know, <laughs> and the simple thought crossed my mind, is this really the example I want to set as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? And the answer was a resounding no. A resounding no. What had I not done? I had not applied the steps to my life in depth on every aspect of my life. I did, unbeknownst to me, just enough to get by. And I have come to believe this, that if we're going to be happy, joyous, and free... I have to do this at depth. I'm going to read a couple questions or two. Oops, and I spill my water, and it runs very well. Okay, most professionals I must deal with on a daily basis who are arrogant, ignorant, and deserve disdain, I think it is. Oh, no, and, oh, excuse me, are ignorant and, and uh, by design. <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, well, good. How's that mirror look? Huh? <laughs> if you spot it, you got it. One of the things that made me crazy after I was a few years sober is when I saw someone behaving the way I had behaved. I promise you, if you look at this, and I'm not trying to make fun of you, you look at your inventory and you look at this, you'll know exactly what they're up to. And the most important thing to do is to be an example to them of how it can change. You know, they always say in AA, when you point your finger at somebody else, there's three pointing back at you. You heard that? Everybody heard that? Yeah. What they don't tell you, it's about the good stuff, too. If you see something in somebody else that touches your heart and lifts you up and you think, my God, they're wonderful, the only way you can see that is it already exists in you. You see, I believe the 12 steps are designed to teach me something I would have never believed. That I've been good and I'm acting rotten. I always thought I was rotten and trying to get good. Uh -uh. I am good, but I can act rotten. I don't know if that makes a difference to you, but that made an incredible difference to me. It gave me a freedom like I've never known. So these, these people who are arrogant in that by design, why don't you just kill them with kindness? Why don't you just be the most excellent example of the best member of AA you can ever be? Because it's important, the reflection we give. I was having a conversation with the, one of the guys I sponsor. We were at a restaurant, 
And it was exactly this. I said, you need to be an excellent example of AA no matter where you go. You need to be held accountable. And you need to make sure how you behave. And we're sitting there. We're having a great AA conversation. You know how you have those every once in a while? You just get to a restaurant. Well, the waitress comes over after about 45 minutes. And she said, uh, man, I'm sorry. I forgot to turn your order in. And you know what I said to her? I said, how refreshing. Thanks for being so honest. I blow it from time to time, too. Go ahead and turn them. She said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, no, it's no problem. And she said, are you sure? And I said, no, no. It's fine, we're having a good conversation. Just turn. She went and got the manager, and the manager come and said, are you okay, sir? Are you just... <laughs> and I said, yeah, she blew it. I blew it. You know, well, I, I said, I appreciated the honesty. And we continued our talk about being an example, no matter what situation in there. As we got about halfway through our stakes, when the... A couple got up from the booth around the side from me, on the other side. And they came up and this guy said, your voice is so familiar. Are you Ed M. that talks in AA? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I am. He said, I just wanted to thank you. Your talks have changed my life. And his wife was there with tears in her eyes thanking me. Now imagine if I'd said, you did what? Think about it. Not only would I ruin her day, but here's a guy who had some hope and trashed it just because I was a little moody. Really is important. So that's what I would say with those people you work at. Show them your best unselfish condition you can give them. And there's no question there. I like those. Ex-husband, shoot him. (laughs) That rotten, dirty... If you see my wife, get her too, you know. Isn't that what we think? Terrible. And it's a good question because it causes a lot. You know, uh, there again, our number one problem is resentment. I have a dear friend of mine who was with me when I was drinking. He just came into my life two weeks ago again. And this is after like 40 years. I see him from time to time, but He's a dear friend of mine, Ronnie. He always had my back. I always had his. And when I got sober, started to get sober, we'd walk into places and he'd go, Eddie ain't drinking. You know, that's the kind of guy he is. And he and his fiance came from some counseling for me. And for three hours, they screamed and pointed fingers about yesterday. Well, you did this and you did that. Well, remember when you did this and you did that and you... And at the end, I said, you know, how's this working for you? They've been doing this for six years. You see, I'm the kind of guy that if they come to me like that and they say, you know, we've been working on this marriage, I'd say to them, maybe God doesn't think it's a good idea. Don't blame this mess on God. He's washed his hands of it. And I said, 90% of your problems is living in yesterday and mission today. Living in yesterday and afraid it's going to happen to tomorrow. Wasn't well, that the same with exes? I, I, am, uh, I was married for 10 years, uh, and I have three children out in Long Beach, California, and for a number of years they absolutely, absolutely hated every breath I took because their mother did not like me, and for her own reasons didn't. And some of them were quite valid, I might add. And in the last few months, I've been able to email and write my kids. They're now 18, 19, and 25. My oldest son's majoring in Vicodin. Hopefully, he'll get to N.A. pretty quick. And uh, it doesn't look like it. I think he'll be dying pretty soon if he doesn't do something, because now he's got the the meth thing going with the Vicodin. That's not a good mix. But uh, all I ever tried to do with my ex was try to work this program, and I didn't always do great. Every Two years ago, New Year's Eve, was the first time I yelled at her in 15 years. And I apologized immediately. Because if something's going to change in our relationship, again, it's got to start with me. I can't wait for her to understand what she's done or him to understand just the impact he did and the wrongs and rights. And blah, blah, blah. That's called control and manipulation. And what i got to do is i got to live my best today. Now, there again, forgiving them, does that mean everything they did was okay? No. It just means you're not paying the tab anymore. And they don't own you anymore. And that's tough because, you know, if you start hating the ex, then, that, then you might have to get involved with somebody currently. <laughs> you know, and then you've got to start fresh. 
And that's scary, too. Clint H. one time was talking to me, and, uh, and it had been a series of whines from me. How you doing, Ed? Oh, well, you know, and on and on. How you doing? Well, then people are looking at me funny. And, you know, and this went on and on. Finally, one day he said, how you doing, Ed? And I said, well, well, he said, you know, Ed, you've got to fight through a lot of happiness to be that miserable. <laughs> Pretty much got my number. And I didn't know I was doing it. It's the ones in my life. Give up the ones on your ex-husband, just for this weekend. Give up the ones on your ex-husband. And if you don't feel better by Sunday night by doing that, take them all back. But just give them up for today. Just give them up for this weekend. All the ones about your ex-husband. Because there was something about him that you got... You married him. There always is. You know, we always downplay it. And so that's not true. It was rotten. I didn't see this. I didn't see... Well, what did you see? You know? And there's, there's something good in the worst of us. So uh, your ex-husband, uh, my advice was get unmarried. I wouldn't even make him my ex-husband anymore. It's not my, I try not to say my ex-wife anymore. I say the mother of my children. That's positive. Okay, one more. I, I can't make sense of this one. Sorry. Using while pregnant during firstborn. How do you forgive yourself for that? Um, God, excellent question, and thanks for your honesty. Really appreciate it. I was gonna, that was my next move I was going into. The toughest, toughest thing for me to forgive ever was me. Toughest, toughest person ever to forgive is me. I challenge people who are having a tough time with a little simple line. I challenge them to actually treat themselves as if they actually like them. Whatever problem you're going through right now, I want you to start treating yourself as you would someone you loved and respected and admired. With the same compassion, love, and understanding you would somebody you actually cared about. And most people, their eyes roll back in their head because that is so foreign from anything I ever knew. But it's the first step in forgiving ourselves. And especially drinking and using with children. It is a disease. That's not a, I know a lot of people are saying crap today. But, you know, sooner or later they'll get into the rooms and get sober too. Don't worry about them. Uh, it's like new medication. We've been through this in the 80s with Librium and Valium. We're losing people right and left. And sooner or later, people will get back to, no, don't work. A few cases it does. That's the killer. Most it doesn't. But uh, I would suggest, um, I, lost my, I lost my train of thought again. First pregnant. Um, it is a disease. And if I had a brain tumor, Uh, that made me do those things. Would I hate myself then? Um, And I don't know whether your child's healthy or not, if there are some repercussions or not, but either way, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. The most gracious thing you can do is love that child and love yourself. I hear a lot of people in AA say, you know, I can't love anybody else till I love myself. (laughs) We're not self-involved anymore, are we? Yeah. Make it all about me, okay? And then I'll make it about you. But make it about me first. <laughs> it's like people say, God's testing me. I know God's testing me. That's right. He forgets the entire world just to screw around with your day. That's his idea. You're that important. That's exactly right, you know? I fell in love with the membership and fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And because they loved me, I came to believe that I was lovable. Because they loved me, and I loved them long before I loved me. Came to believe that I was lovable. When we get things like uh, death, you know, or our children, those things that get so close to our hearts, those are the tougher to forgive. But once you forgive them, you get the most freedom. I would suggest to you this, that you didn't do it intentionally. And if you did it intentionally while you were under the disease, it's still under the disease that you have a right to be forgiven. 
and now's the time. Or you can hang on to that and feel guilty forever. It's your choice. I had dinner with my dad. He told me he was proud of me and loved me. And I uh, went to a meeting afterwards and I got over to my mother's, I got over to my sister-in-law's house and my mother called and she was crying and hysterical and I said, what's wrong, mom? And he, she said, come home quick, Ed. Uh, Dad went across the street to get himself a quarter beer and me a bottle of pop, and now they're carrying bodies out, and there are policemen everywhere. I don't know what's going on. And I had, uh, I had a pseudo-intellectual God at that time. What I mean by that is I started professing a faith I didn't have. I went from atheist to mimicking every word I heard old-timers say. Why? Because I'd look in those old-timers' eyes, and they'd talk about God, and I knew they were telling the truth. So I started parroting whatever they said. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Easy does it, live and let live. And I'm driving across town that night, and we had that, an ice storm. We get them in the Midwest where you get about a quarter inch ice over everything. It's just amazingly hard to drive. And I'm thinking, well, God's in my life now. Nothing bad can happen. And I pull up there, and I remember uh, seeing more policemen than I've ever seen in my life. Now, you don't know my story. I'm a cop fighter. Used to be. When I saw a badge, I swung. I don't care if you were a crossing guard. I'd take you out. You know, just the way it is. Let's see what you got, big fella. Or little lady. I don't know. You know, if I saw a badge, I swung. And when I got out that night, an amazing thing happened. I was a little over a year sober, and those cops had shaped up like nobody's business. I found out amazing things. If I don't talk about their heritage, they don't talk about my heritage. If I don't talk about their sexual behavior, they don't talk about my sexual behavior. Amazing stuff. And in that year I'd been sober, I'd been working in the courts, and I grew to respect law enforcement. My greatest enemies, I realized, were there to protect people like, I, from people like me from people like I used to be, you know. And I went in there, and there were cops everywhere. And I walked in, and one of the officers said, Ed, what are you doing here? And I said, my dad was in here. He said, oh, I got it. And I said, why? What's going on? He said, Ed, all we can tell you is somebody walked in, opened fire, and shot everybody. And I looked down the bar and I saw that pool of blood with my father's glasses all smashed up in it. And I knew, but I didn't want to know. I just knew, but I didn't want to know. And I, I turned to the officer and I said, what, what do I do? Because the only thing I knew how to do was fight. The only thing I knew how to do was rage. And my heart was broken at, depth at that point. And I didn't know what to do. And all these emotions were coming at me like semi-trucks, just... And he said, Ed, go up to the hospital. Uh, they've taken everybody up there. Some are dead, some are alive. Go up and see if your, your dad's there. So I went up to the hospital, and there was an officer up there that hadn't forgotten my past. And he was rude, and he was nasty, and he was vulgar, vulgar and quite inappropriate. Basically what he said is, uh, if I stayed up there, he'd have me run in for obstructing justice, and it'd be in my best interest to get out of there. He'd identified my de- all, the, all the bodies my old man wasn't there. And an amazing AA miracle happened. I said, okay, and I left. A year and a half before that, they would have been looking for a new lieutenant because nobody talks to me that way. Not still standing. Nobody. And I left. And I called the one cop that for the last five years of my drinking and escapades tried to put me in prison. You know why I called him? He was a good cop. You know why I know he was a good cop? He could have set me up 3,000 different ways, but he never did. He used to say, I'm going to catch you straight up, Ed. And when I do, you're going away for a long time. And I used to say, everything's fair in love and war, chump. That's the guy I called. And he said, Ed, what's going on? And I said, my dad was in that tavern. And Bob said, oh, my God, Ed, hold on. And he fed me information. Is it coming in? This is an active murder investigation. So you know they ain't supposed to do that. But he did. Because he knew me and he knew from where I came. And he kept saying, are you all right, Ed? And I said, yeah, I, yeah, I'm okay. I just need to find Dad. And they said, well, all we can come up with is that he got wandered outside after he got shot or they took him hostage. So we formed a search party. And we searched the streets for 10 hours that night. And the only thing I could, rem- uh, only thing I could remember was the serenity prayer, and I could remember it one word at a time. That's all I could handle. And we searched the streets all night. At 8 o'clock the next morning, that officer called me up and said, Well, Ed, anybody could have made a mistake. Why don't you come up and identify your old man? 
And I remember walking up there into that morgue and seeing my dad laying there with that bullet hole in his face. And uh, I reached for that faith I'd been professing and came up with a handful of nothing. It had just been everybody else's words and none of my experience. God, I'd never been more alone in my life. My heart had never been broken that deeply before in my life. And I had never felt so apart from in my life. And I opened that door and went to walk out, and there was members of AA and Al-Anon standing there. You see, God does for me what I can't do for myself. And they just started walking with me. And everywhere I went, there was members of AA. If any of you here have ever had a loss, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Everywhere I went, there was a member of AA. It was Iowa's most heinous crime. And please, God, it always stays that way. That's one of my prayers every day. Let it stay that way. We don't need anything to top that one. And I remember uh, going everywhere, and it was kind of like a daze, and then they, they had the funeral. And the guy that did my father's funeral gave me one of the keys to the kingdom. He was a Catholic priest named Father Grubb. Now, that might not be unusual, but we were Lutheran. And Lutherans and Catholics in the Midwest didn't get along too good, if you know what I mean. And, uh, but Dad, six months before he got murdered, uh, went to the hospital, and he was sick, and he called the spiritual care department. And he said, I'd like somebody to come up and baptize me. And this Father Grubb came up and baptized Dad. And Dad really liked him. He said, you know, he was a good guy. He'd never talk about the baptism, why he did it. Nobody's business. That's the way Dad was. But he said, I really liked him. So Mom thought, you know, it's the only member of the clergy the old man ever liked. We better see if he can do the funeral. And in the middle of the funeral, he said something that gave me one of the keys to the kingdom. He said, you know, a lot of people would say Clifford's death is God's will. He said, I don't believe that for a minute. And I sat right up in the pew. He said, I believe God created human beings, gave us all a free will. Some of those human beings chose to do this, and now it's God's will. And it was like the weight of the world fell off my shoulders. Because I had it all. If there's a God, why are the kids starving in Africa? Real simple. We're not feeding them. God gave us more than enough. Ain't his deal. He's provided. We haven't. If there's a God, why are people dying of cancer right and left? Because we pollute everything we touch and want to blame everybody else. Don't blame it on God anymore. It's his deal. Breaks his heart worse than it does ours. God didn't kill my dad to teach me a lesson, which was the first thought I had when I walked into that morgue, because I still had some ones from church. It was a one that said, anything you bring into this life will come into your family's lives for generations to come. And my first thought was, he killed dad to get even with me. And when he told me that, I came to believe from that day to this, that if it isn't good, it isn't God. If it isn't good, it isn't God. It's of human nature, but it isn't of God's nature. And man, I love that. I love that. And it gave me one of the keys to so I could finally forgive that God. You know, I'm not going to tell you that God killed Dad, so I'd like God. But I believe this. In every tragedy in our life, there's a couple ways we can look at things. We can look at God's grace, or we can look at reasons to be angry. I chose for a lot of years to look for reasons to be angry. And then I realized that I had to start looking for, at things to find some peace. And uh, that's given me a lot of peace. What he's given, I've been able to share that with people all over the world since that for the last 30-some years. And, and, and it's brought a lot of comfort and peace. But you see, that's the way the God I know and love is today. Imagine if I still had my old God. I would have missed all that. And I would have been as much of an empty vessel, empty with any goodness, just full of anger and rage. And what good would I be to anybody then? Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I love I identify with how to forgive my dad for cheating on my mom when I was a teenager. I had that exact experience. I had that exact experience. 
And why I got so hotty toddy about my dad cheating on my mom, I guess it's the only self-righteous thing I could get. Um, you know, because what is there I haven't done? You know, before I start hating him and taking his inventory, let's take a little look at ours. You know, uh, what, what, good is, what good is that memory serving you now? What goodness does that bring into your life that your father cheated on your mother? And how faithful have you been? I had a guy, I got a guy I sponsor and he says, uh, and I don't mean to be offensive, it's just the truth as I see it. He said, you know, I've been 100%, he, he, he invited me to go hear him talk and I thought he's heard me talk a hundred times, only fair I go to listen to him once, you know, and talked and he said, I've been 100% faithful to my wife for the last 12 years, just 100% faithful. Driving home, he said, what do you think of my talk? I thought, well, you need to be a little more honest. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you've been, you said you've been 100% faithful to your wife. And he said, well, I have. And I said, oh, so when you're in the shower and when you're alone, you're only thinking of your wife, huh? I went, oh. You know? Just be honest. He said, what do I say? Say, I'm more of a faithful husband than I've ever been. That's the truth. But when you're having your intimacies everywhere, don't say you're 100% faithful. If you're on that Internet three hours a night, don't be telling how faithful you are, because you're a liar. And the nice thing about being here is we can be honest about where we're at. And that there's some integrity in that. So I, I would say to you, what payoff are you getting for hanging on to that resentment. What's your payoff? Do you feel superior to your dad? Do you feel like you can blame them rather than you? I mean, there's, there was always payoffs. I remember when I, the day I realized I, there was a payoff of being a son of a murder victim. I realized that and it made me sick. Because I didn't know. But there was. I'd walk into a room, oh, Ed's dad was murdered. Oh, oh. And I'd go into, yeah. I didn't know I was doing that. Didn't know there was a payoff. Little attention getter. You know, what would happen if you forgave your dad for doing that? Would the relationship heal? That might be a bigger problem than forgiving. Because then you'd have to grow up. And I'm not big on growing up. I want to hold on to those childhood angers. I don't want to work this program in my life with my father, especially if I feel real good about hating him. Because that's my identity. And if I give that up, who would I be? You'd be a happy, joyous, and free person. But until you give that up, it's just going to haunt you and it's going to own you. Okay, I have a good question. I have a brother who refuses to give me, to forgive me because I'm an addict. He never speaks to me. Should I forgive him? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you know what? If you continue to work this program and you can con continue changing, there will be a time when he can't help but speak to you. Because your actions are going to speak so loud, he can't hear a word you say. I don't know about you, but I'm sorry I had to eliminate from my vocabulary. Because I'm sorry is when I dismissed you. Oh, that hurt your feelings? Sorry. <laughs> See ya. It's like making amends. I couldn't go say sorry. I had to go up to Karen and say, Karen, what in your eyes can I do to make this right? You're the one that was harmed. Eighth and ninth ain't about you. It's about the harm we did out there, making their lives better and repairing the damage we did. If you still think it's about you, go back to four and five. You're missing something. You know? You're missing something. So if your brother isn't talking to you, you work the program the best you can and understand that maybe some of the damage you did in your disease may never be repaired. But for you not to forgive him uh, just keeps you sick too. So you don't forgive him. You forgive him for him, but you forgive him for you too. Because if you don't, sooner or later, it's going to come back to haunt you. I have forgiven, but he can't, but he won't, uh, uh, 
He still wants to punish me for my part. I have already done my ninth step also, twice. You know, just because you say sorry doesn't mean there isn't some repercussions. <laughs> That's part of the deal. That's part of the deal. And what I would suggest to you is, is uh, uh, if you made your amends twice and they haven't accepted it, you continue to be you and work your program, be a continuing example of the amends you made, and not go back to your old attitude about, well, you got to forgive me, or, or hating them because they don't forgive you. I mean, if, if, if one person's going to be sick, let it be them. That's what I'd say. Infidelity. Oh, good one. There you go. There's a whole new program for everybody, you know. <laughs> I remember when I quit smoking a number of years ago, I used to say, you know, it's the only vice I had left. <laughs> like, that was the truth, you know. I bought it. I bought it. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> Infidelity, there, uh, I would suggest there's a time in our lives that when, uh, at least in my life, when I wouldn't trade my integrity anymore. And if it was a habit, then I needed to apply these steps to that habit. And I needed to be relieved of that obsession. You know, there's over 236 different registered 12-step groups. Now, did you know that? 236 different 12-step groups. Kind of tells me that whatever comes up in life, these steps are work for. <laughs> so if it's infidelity, if it's on your part, uh, start working these steps on it and apply 1 through, th one th through 12 on your infidelity. Uh, and if it's on their part, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, people hanging in with people who are, you know, uh, uh, not being faithful because it's just a matter of time before you're hurt again and you either like doing that and you like staying sick. I don't know. But if it's on somebody else's part, I would simply say... Uh, and what I have said is, if that's what you want to do, that's your right, but I won't be co-signing your deal. I don't do that in a relationship. You know, it's really something that after you're sober for a while, you don't do crazy anymore. I don't do crazy anymore. Honest to God, I, I used to love crazy. You know, that old, two dinglings don't bake a bell. You want to bet? You know? <laughs> God, I love crazy. And then I realized that crazy was just going backwards in my sobriety and in my program. When I got into the ministry uh, uh, 14 years ago, I realized I had to hold myself to a higher standard than I've ever held before because I love women, always have loved women. Man, do I love women. And I realized that if I'm going to be in the ministry, I've got to hold myself to a higher standard than ever before. Uh, and I was willing to do that. And one of the things I understood is I couldn't do crazy anymore. And I said, God, if somebody's interested in me, you need to hit me with the two-by-four. Because I ain't going there. I cannot trust me. If somebody's interested in me, you hit me with the two-by-four and I'll know. And I'm speaking out in Oklahoma. And there's this gorgeous girl. Gorgeous. God, gorgeous. And I'd met her a few years ago and she was always just terribly gorgeous. And she walked up to me after me and said, Ed, can I talk to you? And I said, Sure. And she said, I, I hope I, I don't offend you, but uh, I'm just really attracted to you. And I went, oh, why? <laughs> well, thank you. Inside, I'm going, thank you, Jesus, thank you, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and we started talking. It was wonderful. I mean, we had that connection. And we talked, and I should say just talked, for about three weeks every day, two and three times a day. We prayed together. We talked together. It was, like, amazing. And in about three weeks, she started telling me what I needed to do for her to be happy. <laughs> and I said, you know something? I'm not for you, dear. I don't do crazy anymore. If you can't be happy on your own, then we don't need to be together. And I left. Freedom from the bondage of self. Freedom from the bondage of sick dependencies that some Tom Cruise, you complete me. You complete me. May complete Tom. And that's fine. God completes me. I get real nervous when people say, you know, I don't know if anything had happened to them if I could make it. 
It's called real dependency on the wrong higher power, I'll tell you. And it's really, really, really scary. So I don't do crazy anymore. And I like not doing crazy. And I find out that I'm just ha as happy and joyous as free as everybody else wants to be. And that I, I have given up that sense of there has to be somebody in my life for me to be happy. Now, I'd like there to be someday, but that's none of my business. And the reality of it is I have thousands of people in my life. My email list is 375 people that I write to a lot. And I love all of them, men and women. And I love them equally. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. One more. I can't forgive my ex for beating me. He's deceased. He's still beating you. Uh, no, and I'm not trying to be funny. I'm dead serious. He's still beating you here. you got to give him the right to rest in peace, too, because as someone who used to use physical violence, I can tell you that his heart broke every time after it happened, no matter what he'd say to you. No matter what he'd say to you. In the darkness of his own mind, in that jail cell afterwards, he just the self-loathing was incredible. And it's time for you to forgive him. Because people who beat on people, men who beat on women, and dare I say, women who beat and abuse men, are sick. And they need help. Hating him isn't any help. I would suggest you let his memory go. He's already had hell on earth, if that's what he put you through. I would suggest you let him go. You know, back to grieving. A lot of times we want to hang on to the grief. And there's a story about... Uh, a guy who went to see this uh, uh, pastor, and the pastor was there, and uh, uh, the guy was crying. He had lost his son four years ago. And every day his heart was absolutely broken. He could just not look at life without his son being in it. And the pastor said, okay, I know you're a Christian. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to visualize this with me. Would you agree to do that? And he said, yes. And he said, okay, close your eyes. And he closed his eyes and he said, I want you to envision a long line, just thousands of people in white robes. And they're all lined up and they have candles and they're coming up to St. Peter at the gates of heaven. And they light the candle and when they light, their, their face illuminates and they're bright and then they get to go into heaven. And you've never seen them. Can you envision that? Can you see them going in? He said, yeah, I sure can. He said, okay, I want you to envision a bench over on the left. And your son sitting there with his candle. And he said, then I want you to ask your son a question and I will answer for your son. Would you do that? And he said, yes, I will. And he said, uh, okay. He said, ask your son why he's sitting there. And he said, son, why are you sitting there? And the son said back, every time I get in line and I go to light my candle, your tears drown it out. I can't go in. And he said, I want you to allow your son to get in line and light his candle. You see, even when it's love or even when it's ill feelings, we pull on those memories and we pull on those spirits. Everybody's bound up. It's probably time to let that spirit go free. I mean, what can he owe you anymore? How can he make up for the abuse he's done? And the abuse continues because you keep thinking about it. I ask you to leave the abuse here and leave the sadness here and leave that incident here. The guys that uh, killed my father, they got them all. There was five young men. They were gang members. And uh, I had to go uh, to trial. And I remember walking into court, and I saw this one guy sitting there, and he had his little do and his little attitude. And I thought, you know, you give me five minutes with him, we don't need a trial. <laughs> but I'd gone to, you know, I'd been going to AA, and they said, you might be the only example of AA anybody ever knows. You've got to go to court and behave. I thought, what an order. I can't go through with it, you know. Because <laughs> court was where you really let a rock and roll, you know. But I went to court, and I remember looking at him, and I just behaved myself. And uh, testified about finding my, uh, identifying my dad's body in his billfold, and things like that. And then I left, and they convicted him. And uh, I was pretty pleased about it. Uh, now we'll fast forward uh, 27 and a half years. And uh, I'm a pastor in Davenport, Iowa, the same place I was born and raised, about five miles from where I got sober. And I'm preaching on forgiveness one day. And I stop right in the middle of the sermon and I say, you know what? I've got to stop. 
because I have never told the guys who killed my father that they were forgiven. You see, forgiven is just part of it. If they don't know, it's still self-serving. I need to tell them. That's the completion of the forgiveness. And I said, I will not preach on forgiveness again until each of them know that they're forgiven. As God would have it, two and a half weeks later, one of the guys' sentence was overturned after 27 and a half years. And they said, you know, either retry him or let him go right now. And the press all came to me in my hometown. I'm well known there and in, in a nice way now <laughs> because of how you guys taught me to behave. And the press come up and they said, uh, Pastor Ed, what do you think? And I said, you know, it's time to heal. Let him come home. Let him, let him, let him regroup. Let him do whatever he's got to do. Let him start fresh. And they said, well, he went in there when he was 17. He doesn't know how to work. Where's he going to live? He doesn't have a trade. And I said, he can come live with me if he'd like. And they were taken back by that. And I'm not sure why, because I'll tell you, this last hour and a half has been from my experience. I'm not telling you things that are to make you feel good. I'm telling you things that change my heart and my mind. And that story went around the world. I heard from 2020. I heard from 48 hours. I heard from Oprah. <laughs> How can you do that? How could you do that? And I said, well, Oprah, you know, if you're working step eight and nine, you kind of, you know. And, um, and uh, it literally went all over the world. It was on the front page of the Los Angeles Times, London Times, New York Times. And two and a half weeks later, I'm walking down a prison cell, or prison hallway in a prison that my brother uh, spent a lot of time, and I swore I'd never go there again. And I certainly would never be locked up there. And I'm walking down that prison to see a guy. Last time I saw him was 27 and a half years before that. And I said, you give me five minutes. We don't even need a trial. And I walked into a cell, and there he was with his attorney. You want to know how well AA works? Now, you are not going to believe this, but honest to God. At first, I couldn't remember the names of the guys that killed my father. Are you kidding me? You could hate on that forever. Couldn't remember the names. His first name was Sherman. I kept thinking Sherman Williams, the paint. You know, Sherman Williams. <laughs> that wasn't it. But I walk into the cell, and there's the guy I saw 27 and a half years before, and said, you give me five minutes, we don't need a trial. And I stuck out my hand to him, and I said, Sherman, my name's Reverend Ed Mutum, and I'm here to tell you that God loves you, and I love you. And he forgives you, and I forgive you. And if there's anything I can ever do in your life to make your life better, please allow me to do that. Because I didn't want him to own me anymore. And he hadn't for a long time. And he looked into my eyes and he got that I wasn't some con artist. I wasn't trying to run it. I wasn't some goody two-shoes. I was telling him it's time for this to heal. It's time after 27 and a half years for something good to come out of this. And the oddest thing happened. We became friends. We talked for two and a half hours. When we were done talking, the attorney, state's attorney general was there. The warden was there. His attorneys were there. And the guards were there, and we all said the Lord's Prayer, and we all cried together because an incredible healing had taken place. Now, how'd that happen? Did I learn that in seminary? I learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. They said, Eddie, if you got a problem with somebody, you go and you talk to them about it. And when something needs to be done, you go talk to them face to face. And you stand up straight and you be a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous because you might be the only example they ever see. And the oddest thing happened, Sherman and I became close. And I went to the county attorney and I said, uh, let him plead to second degree murder. That way he'll get out in two or three years. And he said, oh, I had the guys conning you. He said, he can't be conning me. He don't know I'm here. I'm here because I want to be here. I, I was praying and God said, go help your brother. Because you want to know something about Sherman? The only difference between him and I is the right situation, the right amount of chemicals. That's about it. It's the only difference between Sherman and I. And I went down there, and he listened to me, and he said, okay, Ed, I'll let him plead to second-degree murder. And two and a half years later, I got a call from the corrections facilities, Iowa State Correctional Facility, and they said, Reverend Mutum, we're going to release Sherman at 8 o'clock in the morning at Fort Madison State Penitentiary. We want you to come pick him up. We will only entrust him to you, and you need to take him to the halfway house. Please have nobody else there. Only in AA can the son of the murder victim be the only one they trust. 
because there was other family members, uh, not my family members. Well, my, my kids hated me for this for a number of years. That's why they didn't talk to me for about four. Here's how hate kills. My kids didn't talk to me for four years because I forgave the guys who killed their grandfather, one they had never even met. They didn't even know him. Look at what we do to our children. Look at what we do to our children. And uh, I remember taking Sherman to a restaurant after we got out of prison and we walked into this place. And I said, now, when you go in, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. They're not trying to hassle you. They just need to get basic information. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you'll see. You know, we went in and the interrogation began. How do you like your eggs? What kind of toast? You know, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, for 20, you know, for 30 years at that time, Sherman been going, hmm, <laughs> And I said, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. Just answer them. She's not trying to help you. And he came out and said, man, those were a lot of questions. I said, yeah, they were. <laughs> and then I couldn't think about it. I couldn't help but think about it. This morning when I woke up and I looked out at my window. And uh, Sherman stopped. We walked out of the restaurant and there was a pond right over here. And he stopped and he said, Reverend Mutum, would it be okay if I just looked at this pond for a minute? And I said, sure. And it dawned on me for 30 years he had never been able to stop and take in a view for 30 years. What was he guilty of? Sherman got muscled into coming along. The two leaders, the two gang members, uh, scared him to death, and he was the lookout when the shoot had start, shooting start. He ran, and he served 30 years for it. How many ponds are we missing? How many of yous are we missing in life? He taught me so much. He, uh, they started muscling him there, down there at the halfway house. And one thing about a life where you start giving them crap, they give you crap right back. So they said they violated his parole. And he went back for a year and a half. And he called me up a year and a half later and said, Ed, he said, uh, he said Reverend Ed, he said, I don't know if you'd want to help me or not. Uh, we'd been in contact a little bit. And I said, well, you can still come live with me. I said, that, I meant that. That wasn't conditional, you know. I believe in you. I think you can do this thing. So he came and lived with me. And I was able to uh, buy him some clothes. And I was able to get him a little apartment. I was able to get him set up. And people said, how can you do that? And I said, AA did it for me. I wouldn't have a dime and you'd pick up my meal. You knew I was hungry, so you'd invite me over for dinner with your family. How dare I give my friend any less than what you've given me? And I really believe. The way you treat uh, the least in your life is the most important, you know. And Sherman didn't become a least in my life anymore. And he, uh, he and I had a good friendship for a while, and then he met a little blonde girl. <laughs> and he got himself a new higher power, and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> and he doesn't owe me a thing. Not a thing does he owe me. What I hope is he passes on exactly what I've tried to pass on to you. Forgiveness is very important. It's a powerful thing. And it can heal a lot of lives.